and Anna Dimerstein from the University of Bath, Argentina. Um, I want to ask about China and, and uh, the comment by Martin Schatz about the, the, the democratization of the world because of what's happening in China rising as a, as a, a nation or civilization. Uh, my question is about uh, what Encarnacion should mention about, it's not economy, but political economy. Is he conflating what de westernization with decoloniality? Because for me, China is rising as an economic power, liberalizing the markets, becoming part of the capitalist world in its own way, exploiting the people in China, and as well as investing, uh, you know, foreign direct investment from China and Latin America, for example, are very important, and so on. So I cannot see how the rise of China as an economic power could lead to the democratization of the world. I think he's conflating that with perhaps the possibility for the Chinese people to democratize themselves as the, the regime, in my view, at some point will have to open up because it will be a, a problem of you know, liberalizing the markets with, that, with authoritarian regimes. But do you think it's... Yeah, can you, yeah. No, thank you. Uh, thank you, that because that will allow me to clarify what, um, what I have in mind and the way I see it. Um, <clears throat> well, China is the most visible, but the BRICS are clearly a kind of tra in the trajectory of de-Westernization. What do I mean by de-Westernization? This is the first time in the history of the modern colonial world since the 1500s in which capital and knowledge are in the hands of people of color. That is what I meant when I was talking about citizenship and racism. The BRICS are people of color. And you say, well, the, the Russian are white. Yeah, what? <laughs> what do I, I mean, each of the five countries have a different uh, genealogy and story. I, I make a long story short. China and Russia were never colonized they didn't escape coloniality, right? So that is a kind of, they, and they had been, I mean, the, the Russian are, are, are white, but they are Orthodox Christian. They have Cyrillic alphabet. They are a slave. And then go read Hegel and, and, and Kant and see what they say about these people. So, well, uh, so uh, Russia and China are kind of imperial difference, what we call, while the, 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 the India and, and uh, and, uh, and, and South Africa is kind of uh, the, the colonial difference. But the point there is that once capital moves to people of color, that gives a lot of confidence. And that confidence is coming up in the kind of affirming themselves through knowledge. So the problem with the westernization is capitalist, as liberal and Marxist will say. Uh, we don't talk about capitalists, we talk about colonial metric of power, but uh, liberal like capitalists, Marxists don't like capitalists, they, they agree that there is something called capitalism. Uh, we decolonize the concept of capitalism too. So the question there is de-westernization, the importance of de-westernization is the first time that capital or knowledge get out of the control. The colonial metric of power that was a, a form of management that was created Transform and control by Western, from Spain to Dutch to uh, France to England to the United States, the first time that they cannot, the West cannot control that machine. And that has a lot to do with the crisis of Europe and has a lot to do with the end of Western domination. Not the end of Western civilization. Western civilization is fine, it may contribute to the human race. But the problem with, uh, with the, the Western civilization is that they wanted the whole world to be like that, right? And the state and democracy and citizenship since the 18th century became a tool hmm, of kind of Western expansion. So that is, while decoloniality it proposed something totally different. It's a, the linking of, the, not disputing the control, with the Westernization does, is to dispute the control of the colonial metric of power uh, to the West. They say, who, who called the shot? But they don't question development. They don't question uh, capitalism. Uh, Chinese companies are a kind of exploiting uh, open, open pit mining in, in Ecuador, in Bolivia, 
together with Australian, with U US, with French, with uh, Canadian, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So that's, and so uh, while the coloniality is a, a movement, let's put it that way, from the political society, and I would like to think that I am part of that political society. Isn't I am not just describing the political society. I am not describing. I, as, an, uh, as, as, as a scholar, as an intellectual, I see myself as part of a political society that needs to produce uh, different kind of knowledge, decolonial knowledge. So, I, uh, and here I will just ask a question to, uh, I mean, no, no, that's a question to you, but the question uh, addressed to you and the project is, what do we want? What do we want with a project like Ecumene? So this, I think, is a, is a very important question because it's a, what do we want and what kind of knowledge we need and what for? Why do, what kind of knowledge we need to produce according to what we want and where we, where we wanted to go? Because I don't see this project as just one more academic project. There is, a, as we said before, an ethical, ethical, political dimension. And I think this has to be addressed kind of openly to kind of brainstorm about what do we want and how to move as part of the, uh, the political society. To take two or three together? Yeah, yeah, let's take three together. Yeah, yeah thank you, uh, Professor Mignon, for, for, for a number of very stimulating ideas. Uh, however, there are a couple of ideas that have left me uh, rather agitated. Uh, the agitation, because some of these ideas may be very well received, because they speak to a nativist agenda, right? Let me just break that idea for a moment and locate myself um, and as to why nativism bothers me. Uh, there was this, this is Indian intellectual Aditya Nagam, who in his book, uh, The Insurrection of Little Selves, points to um, a Malayalam newspaper which brought, which highlighted, at the beginning of the new millennium, highlighted a number of issues that led to greater um, freedom for the world. And he spoke of the arrival of uh, Vashan Gama in uh, Calicut, in Kerala, as one of those great moments of human history, of uh, moments of emancipation and moments of liberation. This is popularly not seen Right, by nativist elements as a moment of liberation. Rather for them, it is seen as a moment of colonization, of, of the destruction of, of, of their golden age. Right? Um, the argument I'm trying to make is that the people who might accept ideas of de-westernization are in fact nativists, and are in fact Western people outside of the West. Just merely because they're, they're not white or they're not European does not make them non-Western, right? It is the people below them, the real subordinates, marginalized by these national communities, that would in fact continue to look towards Europe. They are very happy with the idea of the individual because for centuries and continuing today, they're seen as members of communities, no individuality, right? Um, hence, I, while, while I like the idea, I, I can see where it's coming from. I have a certain amount of hesitation with accepting it. Um, the idea that fills me absolutely with terror is this idea of a civilizational state. Because it's not just China that is building a civilizational state. India has been at it for quite a while, right? Uh, and while India has been doing, and incidentally, a, a couple of friends informed me that India now re refuses to give visas to those persons it deems of Indian origin, right? If you are a person of Indian origin, then you're entitled to this wonderful status called person of Indian origin. You don't need a visa. What is this but the creation, but the destruction of the nation state and the construction of a civilizational state? And this civilizational state is not, is not, is not new, it seems to me, but rather what was uh, Christendom? But the creation, of, uh, the creation of a civilizational state, extending from uh, South, uh, South America to, uh, to Nagasaki, right? Um, so it seems to me that uh, then 
there may still be a few problems with this. Uh, and what's, so I'm not speaking from this. China is a big bad guy, I'm uh, the big fat white guy. Um, but uh, there may be a problem because perhaps this is a repetition of history by national elites who are using this cover uh, to extend uh, empires. And in any case, India was never a colonized space, merely. It was a sub-imperial center animated by, um, by these uh, 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 colonial elites. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. Thank you for this inspiring lecture. I am in the same mode, a bit left a bit agitated with your uh, concluding remarks. I am sure you do not mean this, but I want to point to a possible misunderstanding there. So I, I can look at what I mean. Uh, when I refer to the phrase Anglo-American Cultural Studies discourse, the Anglo-American Cultural Studies discourse, have started despising the nation state. Uh, all these uh, discussions about diaspora cultures and citizenship and so on, uh, because the nation state, but belonging to the nation state and citizenship based on the nation state, is regarded as archaic, primordial, and so on and so forth. So what they propose, this discourse, I mean, there are a few names we can name, but that's not the point, uh, is cosmopolitanism replacing national belonging. Yes, it sounds very nice and so on and so forth, but if, when we start thinking a little deeper into the problem, uh, the, 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 the hyphen between the nation and the state has been damaged. So rather than rushing to a quick uh, conclusion and glorifying cosmopolitanism, I'm speaking to that discourse, uh, we should rethink, the, as we were suggesting in many ways, uh, the, the link between the nation and the state in the South, so South or whatever we want to name. Uh, because that damage, uh, because we cannot so quickly abandon uh, claims uh, to, uh, that are made to the nation state. <coughs> especially when we think of the subaltern in the Turkey world or in the South, their fundamental means of claiming rights has to be the state. So who is this cosmopolitan? What kind of a cosmopolitanism are these subaltern people developing? So I thought, I, I know you don't mean that, but there is that kind of uh, risk. So it's, it has to be, uh, those claims have to be made in the idiom of citizenship. We cannot abandon citizenship either. But rethinking, and so on so uh, rethinking national, the nation state and alternatives to Western uh, notions of democracy, state, and so on and so forth, the China example and uh, uh, Turkish uh, government's new uh, neo-autonomy fantasies, I should uh, say, uh, Civil, uh, the point that you also made, the civilizational state. Uh, these are hardly, uh, we need to be really critical of these uh, gestures. Uh, in the case of China, you know, the challenge of human rights, violation of human rights in China in the name of you cannot challenge, this is our authentic culture kind of thing. And in the case of Turkey, it is hardly uh, an alternative to Western notions of democracy when there are all sorts of claims by its Kurdish population and, you know. So, what's the notion of democracy we can not perhaps too quickly abandon? Of course, have to rethink it, but we have to work through it, I think. When they are replaced so quickly with these alternative models like China or the Turkish government's new Ottomanism, we run into this quick and simple I'm not proposing models. No, you're not proposing that. That is a misunderstanding. I, I'm not proposing that as model. They are. What do we do? <laughs> How do we think about it? Thomas, <laughs> Thomas? Yeah. Mario? Sorry, you know, sorry, the person was proven. Mm -hmm. And then we make another round, and then the next one, yeah? Well. Um, um, George Shirley, uh, Rough and Slow Drawing. Um, uh, 
preoccupied with you. Preoccupied in particular. Um, um, thinking from the exteriority of the Nam West with, 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 with the back of South Africa, the new South Africa in the back of my mind, life uh, as a national citizen and life as, a, as an ethnic subject uh, is likely to run up against one another. Uh, often in contradictory ways, political uh, personhood is fractured, fractured, fractured experience. <clears throat> and they do that in a number of ways. Well, it's not true. Now, a uh, real sociology of citizenship in the new South Africa is put to the test of democratic pluralism, citizenship is not as it is envisaged in political philosophy of the normative future, but citizenship in the concrete politics of a lived experience. So in that sense, I agree with you about the use of one's intellectual labor to think the future as it is emerging. Yes? And I think and I think and I think I'm, I'm, I'm invited by the 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 the, the, the spectral image of the title of your book, The Dark Side of the Renaissance, partly because I can figure out, I begin to think about the possibility of celebrating the fact that the Euro-American archive, which has been in ascendancy for the last thousand years, is now reaching its TDM. It doesn't mean to me proposing a sort of binary opposition, but it rather suggests that we think from a slightly different place. The second comment I'll make I mean, it's not the case that people in cultural studies have given up thinking about the national popular. It so happened that there is a huge debate that's going on about the importance of thinking about the national popular in the light of the South Africanization of the West. Okay? There is a way in which I sometimes think that Europe suffers from a fantasy of apartheid. It wants to go back to whatever Johannesburg used to be. So I, I, I kind of just offer that as a sort of, as a sort of end, you know, agreement with you in the fall. And I think, and I think, and I think the, 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 the question now, for me, is how then, how then does one begin to think about what it means to be human in the phenomenon sense? What does it mean to, you know, I'm an incomplete subject without somebody living with me, yeah? In that sense. What I do is an emergency is something else, you know? I, I think I think the, the living with a difference in that sense, the problem is it opens up the way in which you might think. Now, I end by saying, if you experience the miseries wrought on the sort of global south by the way in which neoliberalism has reworked and revamped itself in and through the concept of democracy, I really want to put it under erasure. Well, uh, I don't know if I can't remember. Uh, but I respond to I, I respond to these three because it's a, a, a kind of um, a menu here. Um, one of the I mean I don't want to. Uh, Martin Jack was kind of I think is enthusiastically recognizing that that is happening. I don't say that China or the BRICS are the model. I would say more when I address, but somehow <clears throat> it related to the first question over there. Um, I see this dewesternization. There are two things that, a uh, couple of things that I'm interested in with dewesternization. <clears throat> One, that is a concept and a project that didn't originate in Europe. It's not like postmodernism or ultramodernism or post-structuralism and all the post tudo uh, that kind of uh, emerge in Europe. This is of fundamental importance, and the fact that uh, that dewesternization, Bandung was already talking about dewesternization, but dewesternization emerged as a strong project in China and, uh, and, and Singapore uh, because because related to the question because. The Westernization or the Chinese or Singapore figure out, Dan Chopin and Lee Kuan Yew figure out something that at the same time in Latin America they couldn't figure out. That independence or the dependency theory cannot be 
uh, achieved by ignoring capitalism, trying to develop, but just what uh, Latin America did was just to hope that the IMF and the World Bank will help them to develop. Dan Chopin and Lee Kuan Yew said no. So what they did, and it's fascinating to me as, as a kind of project, is that they gain independence through capitalism. And I'm interested in that because something like that happened in the 16th and 17th century. Guaman, Puma, de Ayala, Notobá, Cubano, they kind of projected a kind of discourse of liberation appropriating Christianity and criticizing Christianity. And this is related to the question of human rights. Of course China violates human rights, but we know that the discourse of human rights was invented by the people who created a mess. It was not the third world that created the mess that needed human rights. And once Europe invented human rights in the United States to solve the problem that they themselves have created, they began to apply to... Uh, so Chinese have a lot to say, and they are saying it. Even if you, you read China Daily, the, 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 the kind of uh, the, 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 the discussion about human rights are very problematic. Uh, but I won't say that, I mean, like the, the discourse of violence. We have to take human rights out of the kind of ethical, just moral discussion and put it together with the political, what, what is kind of going on there. So that originated, um, originated in the West, uh, in the non-West. So that doesn't, I mean, people in the, in the West can join that project. The fact, I mean, all the projects of the West doesn't mean that it's for Westerners. On the contrary, the West was very happy to include more people that play that game. So the same, the same thing is happening here. So, and Martin Jack seems to be one of the people who began to endorse the project of de-Westernization. So the, the second thing that is, is related is not new, but I think what is interesting here is uh, number one, that comes as a kind of rejection of the nation state in the sense of uh, European conception. And that is why the civilization state is being articulated through Confucianism. When Hillary Clinton went to Cambodia, she had, uh, took the opportunity to just uh, slap in the face of the Chinese for this kind of lack of democracy. So the following day, a New York Times, that was very strange, the New York Times published an article, an op-ed by the director of Confucian Studies in Beijing, and kind of he thanks uh, Hillary Clinton for saying that kind of thing, and he said, most likely China organization of the state is going the Confucian way and not the liberal way. So there is, there is the Confucianism of the state and there is also the Confucianism of the kind of the, 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 part, the other part of the population. But that is what is important here in de-Westernization, to bring Confucianism into the articulation, not of democracy, but of harmony. Should we prefer democracy to harmony? Well, that is for discussion. So there is a lot of things, there is a lot of things that I think is very important, and that's what the Martin Jack is recognizing, and also uh, uh, Mark Bubani, but Mark Bubani is a more, most vested interest in the process of the, the westernization. At the same time, there is a lot to be, uh, to be criticized. Um, <clears throat> I am joined forces with you because uh, I have been writing a lot, of, uh, at least three articles on the why cosmopolitanism came to life uh, after the, 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 the conversation of the nation state. And so I said a lot of things about cosmopolitanism, but the last, the last kind of uh, position I am um, discussing, and I'm kind of taking, is cosmopolitan localism, which is an oxymoron. But precisely, it's an oxymoron that goes in the direction of de-westernizing, decolonizing, and de de-orientalizing uh, the, 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 the kind of universal, the, the universal imperial cosmopolitanism uh, uh, proposed by Kant and taken up by a lot of kind of American, Na Martha Nasbaum and a lot of people. So I think that uh, cosmopolitan localism is a, is, is a way to go, it seems to me, because it's, it's, it's the revival of the local history. So the civilization state in China is very different to the plurinational state in Bolivia. 
Bolivia is 7 million people, one of the poorest countries of the world. China is billion plus, the, the second richest country of the world, or the third. So the plurinational states, they are not, they are questioning why this, why we Indians, uh, Quechuas, Aymaras, uh, Chiquitanos, why should we consider Bolivian? If that identity is the white mestizos of European descent. So if we want to be Bolivian, we have to discuss that. So the plurinational state means a decolonization of the modern colonial state that was put in place by the Creole who indep gained independence from Spain and gave their money to, Indian, uh, to, to, uh, to England and gave their mind to, French, to France. So the same thing is happening with the black population. Uh, so in, 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 in the Pacific, there, there are La Gran Comarca. They don't live anymore in La Gran Comarca. In, in Latin America, they live in La Gran Comarca. La Gran Comarca, so well, that line is a problem of the state of Ecuador and, and, and Colombia. For, for us, that doesn't mean anything. They have to respond somehow, but at the same time, the intercultural politics that they are developing say, well, we are kind of making, uh, making, making ourselves. Uh, so the idea of the plurinational state, we don't want to take the state, like Fidel Castro. We just want to build the, uh, the Ecuador and Bolivian of the future, but on a different basis. So the whole question of democracy, the whole question of uh, citizenship has to be uh, is already in the process of, uh, 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 of being questioned. Indigenous people don't live anymore in Latin America. Latin America is the imaginary of the people of European descent. Uh, indigenous people from Canada to the Mapuche of Chile, they live in Abiyayala. And, uh, uh, and what is the difference? It's, ah, oh, well, but it's Latin America. No, it's not Latin America, because uh, Latin America is a fiction. Latin America is not a subcontinent. Latin America is the political project of the Creole elite who gain independence from Spain and Portugal and crush the indigenous people and the black. But that has changed. That is no longer possible. So that, uh, that is what, uh, what I have to say about... Uh, so I don't... What is interesting to me is that the, the, in this moment there co coexist three trajectories, very complex, each of them. One is re-westernization, which is the Obama project to kind of regain the lead of the West. De-westernization, that is kind of started in the East, but it's all over. And decoloniality, which is a kind of the project of the, and de-orientalizing is kind of, could be either way. I mean, could, could it be either way. So finally, uh, the question of, yeah, I think that this is, what does it mean to be human? And that is a question that uh, Sylvia Winter has been addressing for years. And that is what I just hinted when I said, we cannot discuss citizenship without discussing the question of to, of to be human, because human in the West means the reference point to kind of marginalize and exclude all people of color and all people who don't respond to the idea of humanity as men. Um, so, and, and when Sylvia Winter asks, what does it mean to be human? It's a black woman from the Caribbean, or a black woman from the third world who is asking the question. So it's no longer Clinton saying in the Kosovo, we have to forget the difference because we are all, all human. I say, yeah. <laughs> and then the Zapatistas will say, because we are human, we have the right to the difference. So that is the concept. I mean, we use hum human, but we use citizenship. But for me, the question is what citizenship hides and colonizes, the sense of belonging. And that is the project of a pluriversal future, and that is the project of, um, of a, 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 a local cosmopolitanism. It's not a, 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 a cosmopolitanism that will be imperial, but just to kind of articulate your local sense of belonging and dialogue with others' sense of belonging, not to deny or not to try to colonize. So that's the way, more or less, I see the, the argument. Thanks a lot, uh, Walter and everyone. Uh, we need to finish here. And there's a wide reception, so I'm sorry for the ones of you that would like to raise more questions, but you have a chance now in the wide reception. Thank you. Thank you.